Good morning, everyone. I believe it is 10.05, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Kelsey DeNoyer. I'll be doing the presentation today. We also have Amy Loving, who will be moderating um, and helping me to answer some questions. So feel free to type your questions into the Q&A box um, as we go through the presentation, and I'll try to answer them all at the end. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. So uh, we are Nahum Harsh Education Center, if you didn't know. And so we are a 305 acre urban wetland surrounded by industry here in Southwest Davenport. Um, so we have a lot of stuff going on around us and that kind of influences our education programs and the way that our conservation efforts are run. We are a 501c3 nonprofit agency and have been since 2000. So with that being said, we run largely on donations. So if you'd like to help support us and our programs like this, please check out our website and donate after the webinar. Um, and finally, we have programs resuming in limited capacities this week. So it's really exciting to get back and have people here at the Marsh. Uh, Jimmy Weebler is going to be doing birding starting on Saturday. We'll also be offering some plant hikes. So feel free to check those out on our Facebook and website uh, so we can see you guys again. So a little bit about me. Um, again, my name is Kelsey DeNoyer. I am an AmeriCorps environmental educator. I've been here at Nahant for a little over a year. Um, and I recently graduated from Western Illinois University in Moline with my bachelor's in recreation, park, and tourism administration with a minor in environmental studies. And I would also say I'm a bit of an invertebrate enthusiast, um, thanks to Amy Loving. She's introduced me to a lot of the really cool things um, about insects and invertebrates in general. And you can see here in these pictures that I get really excited about that. So with invertebrates, insects make up a large number of those. And I'm going to be referring to a few of these different um, terms throughout the program. So I just wanted to briefly review them, make sure everybody's all on the same page. So every insect has three main body parts. They have the head, the thorax, and the abdomen. Um, those will be crucial when we're referring to different parts of the dragonflies and damselflies and talking a little bit about um, what makes each one different. All insects also have six legs. Uh, not really gonna be a huge part of this presentation, but important to note. They also have at least one set of wings. Damselflies and dragonflies have two sets. Um, so the front ones here are the four wings and the back are the hind wings. And finally, dragonflies, um, damselflies, bees, all other insects have antenna. So you may not be seeing antenna on this picture here and wondering where it's at. Well, they are insects, so they do have it. They're just really small. Um, I found this really interesting because they're so so unique. Most of them are, you know, pretty large and these guys are kind of vertical in their head. Um, so just an interesting fact about them. So dragonflies versus damselflies. Um, they're pretty different, but most people don't know the difference. So dragonflies lay with their wings open at rest. You can see that in the picture there. They have a very thick thorax and abdomen and relatively large bodies. Damselflies, on the other hand, have their wings folded behind them when they're at rest and a long, skinny abdomen. They're also kind of dainty in appearance. I know a lot of people refer to them that way, um, especially when compared to dragonflies. So just to give you a bit of a, a size comparison here, dragonflies, you can see, are much larger than damselflies. And just for another size reference, this is a damselfly on a person's finger. And I would say this is about the average size of them. So they are fairly small. So just a quick practice, get to uh, make sure you know your damselflies versus dragonflies. So feel free to type this in the chat what you think, or if you just want to guess to yourself, that's fine too. So do you think this is a damselfly or a dragonfly? Give a few seconds here. All right, looks like most people are guessing correctly. It is a dragonfly. 
Got another one. So again, damselfly or dragonfly. Awesome, looks again like people were guessing correctly, it is a damselfly. Another one here, we got a pair, damselflies or dragonflies. And once again, looks like people got it, damselflies. And our last one, damselfly or dragonfly. So this one may be a bit tricky, but it is actually dragonflies. And that kind of segues right into our next topic, which is their life cycle. So dragonflies and damselflies actually start out um, in the water. So the adults lay their eggs in the water, and we'll get to that um, a little bit later. And then they spend a large part of their life living there. So a common misconception about um, dragonflies, damselflies, and kind of insects in general is that they only live for one day. And that's actually false. The shortest life cycle, um, you know, given, not that, excuse me, I'm trying to think the right way to put this. If they are not eaten by predators, um, their longest or their shortest life cycle is six months. So that's a pretty long life, um, I think, for how small these guys are. Um, definitely longer than the one day that most people think. So once they're in the water, the eggs will hatch and these guys are called nymphs and they live in the water until they become adults. So they can actually live as nymphs in the water for up to four years, which I thought was really interesting. So as they grow, um, they get larger and larger and they shed their exoskeleton and that can be about eight to 17 times depending on the species. And again, that can occur anywhere between six months and you know four years, uh, just depending on what species it is. So when they're finally ready to become an adult, they will climb out on to like a plant or um, we get a lot out here that climb up onto our dock, just something out of the water and they'll molt one last time. When they first come out, their colors are usually kind of dull or muted, and they actually only spend a few months of their life as adults before dying. So the majority of their life is spent underwater as nymphs. So the emerging process is pretty interesting too. You can see at the bottom here, first they kind of push out their thorax, which again is that middle part of their body, kind of the chest and shoulders if we want to think of it that way and then their head and their legs and finally the wings. So after they kind of push uh, the majority of their body out or at least the top half, they kind of wait so that their uh, body parts can dry before the next stage. So you can see down at the bottom here, they kind of tilt backwards and withdraw their abdomen. And when they do that, they have a really, really thick abdomen and a really small set of wings. So over about one to three hours, um, the fluids inside of their body will kind of rearrange themselves and go instead from the abdomen to the wings and it will expand the wings. So they leave behind a little cast. I know a lot of us see this with uh, cicadas and other insects and this is called an exuvia. And during this time, they are very vulnerable to predators because it's such a you know, simple process but it takes a really long time and their bodies are really soft and delicate. So I wanted to show a brief time lapse of what this actually looks like. So you can see they're drying out their legs there and a bit of their wings. They have a really thick abdomen and then it expands to their wings. <clears throat> So 
So it takes uh, a pretty long time for their bodies to dry out and for those fluids to redistribute in their body. But once they become adults, their main concern <clears throat> is mating. So some species have particular mating rituals. Um, common rituals would be displaying their wings or zipping around the water to mark their territory. Others aren't as flashy and just have to search and find their mate. So the best flyers and the best searchers are going to be the ones who reproduce. So when they reproduce, the male dragonfly or damselfly will use the end of their tail to grasp the female behind the neck and they actually have um, kind of a opening there so it fits in perfectly. It's, it's meant to be this way. Um, so then the female will bend up her abdomen if she chooses to accept him and they will mate. And while they do this, they form kind of a heart-shaped, what's called mating wheel, which I think is pretty interesting. Um, they can do this while flying or while resting on a plant. So a lot of times you'll see two of these critters together flying through the air and they're probably mating. Um, the length of their mating depends. So for the larger species, it's just going to take a few seconds. And for the smaller species, it can take up to several hours. Um, so some species also vary in their territoriality of the female. And some will even go as far as to scoop out sperm of other males from the female. So some are very... Um, relaxed about their mating and others are very, very specific and territorial. So when it's time to lay the eggs, um, again, depending on the species, some males will follow the female to lay them and others will just kind of take off. So the female will go to lay her eggs in the water and some will rest um, on vegetation as we can see in the top picture here or different aquatic plants and they will scoop their tail kind of um, in a curved shape and lay it underneath of that vegetation. Others will just kind of fly around and dip their tail in and out repeatedly. And they're not really laying on their eggs on anything in particular at that point. They're just kind of dropping them in the water. And those eggs are surrounded by a thick sticky jelly that you can see here and that helps them to kind of stay together and helps keep them protected and to keep them on vegetation if the female lays them on there. So insects are really cool in general, uh, but dragonflies and damselflies also have a really cool adaptation. So as young, they have these really cool mouth parts that help them to catch their prey. So the adult dragonflies and damselflies are actually really incredible predators of the insect world. They eat mosquitoes, midges, butterflies, flies, and more. They are also some of the fastest flying insects. Um, they're the fastest flying in our area, at least. So they can go up to 25 to 30 miles an hour, um, and they average about 10 miles per hour, which is still really fast if you think about how small their bodies are. So um, I wanted to show this brief video here that does a really great job explaining their mouth parts. They're the order Odonata. That's dragonflies and damselflies to most of us. Before the dinosaurs even existed, they had a two foot wingspan, like a small hawk. Today, they're more modest in scale, but no less deadly. Take their eyes. Each tiny hexagonal cell picks up light from a different direction, which gives dragonflies an almost 360 degree range of vision. Four wings help them hover or turn on a dime. That means this hunter rarely misses. The weird thing is, Odonata spend most of their lives in a place where these killer piloting skills don't help. This is where their mothers lay their eggs. When they hatch, the babies, called larvae or nymphs, spend months or years underwater. Their wings are still growing, so they aren't any help in scoring a meal like this tasty mosquito larva. 
It's a larva eat larva world down here. Did you see that? Let's slow it down. The nymph has a killer lip called a labium. Remind you of this creepy thing? For this skimmer nymph, it's shaped like a spork. Only dragonfly and damselfly nymphs have this special lip. This kind of dragonfly nymph, a darner, has an extra surprise. There's a pair of pincers right at the end. It all happens in a fraction of a second. Think of the lip as a knife, fork, and plate all rolled into one. When the meal is over, it folds up neatly, ready for the next occasion. These baby skeeters don't stand a chance. And that's good for us. Let's hope it stays this way for a few million more years. This episode is brought to you by Curiosity Stream. A so I think that video was really awesome. Um, I was looking for different ways to incorporate their mouth part into this presentation, and uh, there is just no way I could do it as awesome as this. So I think that is a really, really cool video, and we'll provide these links to the videos um, at the end of the presentation. Um, so with that, uh, with their mouth parts, you know, a lot of people ask, can these guys bite? So large dragonflies, I know when we do pro programs out here and we're holding them, um, they do kind of try to bite sometimes, but they're not meant to break human skin. They're meant to eat insects. So yes, they can bite, but it doesn't really do anything and it doesn't hurt either, I don't think. Encryption streaming oh. So with that, we'll get into identification of some common uh, species that you may see out around here, especially at Nahant Marsh, but just in Iowa and Illinois in general. So just again, wanted to briefly go over their body parts and um, just remember kind of the things that we'll be looking at. So again, we have the head, the thorax, and the abdomen. So we'll be kind of looking at the color, the shape, and some of the patterns on those body parts. We'll be looking at the wings as well um, with their color, kind of like what they're tinted, if they're clear, if they're dark, the size of them, some are larger, some are smaller, and then the plates. So the plates are the individual scales that make up the wings. And you can see here down in the bottom left corner, um, a really good close-up picture. And a lot of these species have one colored plate on each wing. So we'll definitely be looking at that. And then we also want to consider male versus female. So just like a lot of critters in the animal world, the male is going to be more brightly colored than the female and that's for mating purposes. You know, they want to be flashy um, and attract the mate. So we'll start with the damselfly, the familiar bluet. So remember again that these guys are really small. So if you're looking at them in the field, you're probably not going to notice all of these exact characteristics, but um, this is a good way to learn them is by knowing the details. And then when you're out in the field or you see one zooming by, it's going to be a lot easier to identify them. So the first thing that we see is that they have a really thick black stripe down the middle of their thorax, and then one smaller stripe on each side. Then they also have these black bands around um, kind of each segment on their abdomen. And the male is going to have this really bright blue body. Um, that's pretty easy to remember that he's a bluet because he has the blue body. And then the female is going to be more of like a dull bluish gray or brown, but we can still see that she has those thick stripes on her abdomen and her uh, thorax. And I will say, if you're like, wow, those don't really look that similar, um, it's much easier to identify males in the field than it is females. And that's for everybody unless you're an expert. So don't feel, uh, don't feel a little lost because it's hard for everyone. So the next one is the orange bluet. Um, I think this name is really funny because it just contradicts itself, but 
it's really, really funny to me. So again, um, just like the familiar bluet, they have a thick black stripe going down the thorax and one smaller stripe on each side. But if we look at their abdomen, we see that it's mostly black um, and it just has that orange tip on the tail. And if you remember those um, appendages I was talking about when they're mating, you can kind of see that here actually on their tail where it has uh, kind of a little point and that's where it fits into the female. So again, the male has a bright orange body and then the female is going to be kind of more or of, of a dullish orange or even a tan. Um, some may even see hints of green. It just depends on the individual. But again, we're primarily looking at that um, kind of orangish tint with the thick black um, stripe down the abdomen and that orange tail. So the next one is a little less common, but I think it's really interesting, so I wanted to include it. This one is called the seepage dancer. So it has some varying stripes on its thorax um, and one orange plate on each wing. So we can see that here in the picture at the tip, that orange plate. And they're called a the seepage dancer because they're found where water kind of seeps up from the ground. So we talked about earlier how their eggs are laid in water. That's primarily in places like ponds, um, slow moving streams, lakes, marshes. Um, they're not really gonna be found as much in rivers um, because their eggs are gonna be swept away. But these guys, they like um, kind of vernal ponds or places where the water isn't always there, um, but the groundwater will seep up when it's really saturated and that's where they're found. So the male has this blue body with the orange hues and you can kind of see the orange, um, especially on their legs and then a little bit on their abdomen. And the females are going to look um, a lot different. They have a black and yellowish tan body. Um, the real way to kind of differentiate um, these guys with some others that may look similar. I think it's just looking to see how this seepage dancer, the female, how her colors kind of vary. Most, um, most of the other female damselflies are gonna be, you know, just dull blue or dull yellow. Um, these guys kind of look like a pastel tie-dye to me, I think. This one is a really cool one. Um, these are going to be very easy to identify in the field because there's nothing else around here that looks like them. This is the ebony jewel wing and they have matte black wings and a bright metallic body. So we can see the male on the left here has a uh, metallic blue green body. And then the female, her head is primarily a metallic green, but her abdomen is a bit more matte and it's darker. Again, these guys are really cool. So now we'll move on to dragonflies. Um, so they're much easier to be seeing um, or to be able to identify while they're out in the field just because they're larger, but there are so many of them. And I just wanted to point out really how many. Um, you can see here that there are 11 families around 350 genus and over 3000 species. So, some of the families here um, are hawkers or darners, club tails, spike tails, skimmers, and there's really so many more. If you're interested in learning about the different um, taxonomical groups, I would recommend dragonflysite.com. Um, they did a really great job of explaining the different families and their common characteristics. Um, and just to remind you, this is kind of how the taxonomic order goes. And we'll see here as we go to identify the dragonfly types that the families will look kind of similar in their body shapes. Um, so if you get familiar with the families, you'll be able to at least um, break it down a little bit. You know, if you see a dragonfly in the field and you're not exactly sure what species it was, but you could identify um, maybe some of its family characteristics, that's going to help you. So the first one is the common green darner. This one is, I think, probably the easiest to identify because it is one of the largest and the fastest. And if you've ever seen these in person, um, you know what I mean, they're very, very large. You can see here that their green head and thorax is just really 
wide and thick compared to their abdomen. And if we look at the tips of their wings, both on the forewing and the hindwing, you can see there's kind of a yellow uh, tint along the rim. So the male is going to have this green body and then the blue abdomen with the black markings going along it. And then if we look at the female, you can see we, she still has that bright green body, but her, her abdomen, excuse me, is much uh, different. It's brown or even tan, and the tint on her wings, it's much more pronounced. So another really common one that actually often gets mistaken for the common green garner is the blue dasher. So you can definitely identify these guys by the way that they perch, and that's with their wings forward. They have dark stripes along their thorax, as you can see here, and dark plates along each wing. So the male has a chalky blue abdomen with that black tip at the end, and kind of towards the um, middle of his body, right next to the thorax, there's going to be an orangish yellow tint on the wings. The female is pretty similar again, um, but she has a yellow and black abdomen and she has more of a green tint on the thorax. But the really easy way to identify these is by the pattern on their thorax there and the way that they perch. So the next one here is the Black Saddlebags Skimmer. This one is pretty cool, I think. Um, it looks like it has black saddles on its hind wings near the body, so pretty easy to remember their name. And then they have a small black plate on each wing. So the males are all black, and if you see them flying around, you'll probably be able to identify them right away just because you'll see that the back end of their body is much thicker um, and you can kind of tell it's on their wings, so right away you can know that it's a black saddlebag. And then the females, on the other hand, um, their, their thorax is going to be a lot lighter. You can kind of see through the wing here, it's more of a brown color than it is black. And then they also have a yellow spot on the end of the abdomen. And if we look at their saddles, um, it's not quite as pronounced, but you can still see it, so you can still identify it. And um, hopefully I'm not going through this too fast, but just so you guys know, this is being recorded um, and will be posted on our YouTube page. So if you um, wanted to take notes or you wanted to review something, it will be available for you to see. So the next one here is the Widow Skimmer. This one has a black and white band on each wing and a black plate at the end of each wing. So we can see that here. The male has a really, really light powdery blue abdomen. Sometimes it even appears white, um, but mainly we're looking at those wings. Those are the big giveaway for these guys, at least the males, uh, because if we look at the female, it's not quite as pronounced, um, at least not with that white to contrast it. But we see that her body is uh, black uh, compared to the male's light blue, and then it has a yellow stripe running down it. So. These guys can be easily confused with the saddlebags because they don't have the white, um, you know, if we're looking at the female. But we see that the female widow skimmer has the black on the forewing, whereas the saddlebags does not. So that's our uh, key to be able to distinguish them. And if you look pretty closely, you can see there is still a faint white band. Um, sometimes it's not there, but it usually is at least a little faint. Um, so you can still identify it that way too. The next one is the Eastern Amber Wing. So these guys are really cool because they're much smaller than most of the other species. Um, I would say these guys are only maybe about three inches long compared to other species, which are, you know, at least five inches long. So you have these really large red eyes, which really stand out on their smaller bodies. So the male has dark red abdomen and his, his wings are bright orange and they're covered in these veins, which you can see are kind of a yellowish color. They also have a uh, plate, a colored plate at the end of each tip. But once you see these bright red bodies, you'll know right away it's an Eastern amber wing. And the females are still fairly easy to identify. Again, they're gonna be much smaller 
Um, and they still have that orangish reddish color. They're just a little bit more brown, so they'd be kind of rusty. And you can see on their wings that they have kind of those dark bands. So thankfully this one is uh, pretty easy to identify. And finally, we have the Halloween pennant. So this one is really fun. Um, kids always really like the name of this one. So it gets its name because it's black and orange, as we can see here. Both the male and the female have these banded wings or spotted wings, however you want to call it. Um, so the male is really black and orange. We can see the orange tint on his wings and the black coloration. And then a bright orange, um, almost even appears red, plate on each wing. And then the females and the juveniles will kind of be more of a yellowish color rather than an orange. Um, and you can see that the tip of their wings have yellow plates instead of orange. So I know I went through um, a lot of information today, and like I said, it will be available. But if you're looking for a way to kind of continue learning, or if you want to be able to identify these in the field, I'd recommend these resources. So the first one is the Kaufman Field Guide. Um, so this is a book, and I know it's available um, on Amazon. I'm sure it's available on some other websites. Um, it's relatively cheap, and it does a really, really good job of um, describing the different characteristics of each insect, not just dragonflies and damselflies. The other resource is iNaturalist. This is a really cool app. Um, it's free for Apple and Android. And you can take photos of different things in uh, nature. This is plants, animals, birds, what have you, and it will help you identify it. I will say the downside to this one is it's really hard to get a good picture of a dragonfly or a damselfly because they are such fast flyers. Um, and the damselflies, again, are really small. So this one might be a little bit difficult um, to use for dragonflies and damselflies unless you're catching them and then taking pictures of them that way. The other one here is insectidentification.org. So I found this website while I was doing some research and I thought it did a really good job of helping you to narrow down what you find. So if you see a dragonfly or a damselfly out in the field, um, you get kind of a brief glimpse of it, maybe get to see some of its characteristics, but you can't quite remember what it is or um, just not really sure. You can go onto this website and it gives you all of the different species that are located in our area. And then you can um, X out the ones that you definitely know are not it. Um, so if you saw a, say, an orange dragonfly, you can X out all of the ones that are blue and green, and it will help you to narrow down your search and figure out which one it was. And then the other resource I'd like to share is Quizlet. So I've been making these um, study sets, is what they're called here on this website, and I'll show you quick how we can go to that. I may have to reshare my screen here, so give me one second. Okay, so you can find this website um, by going to quizlet.com and searching for Nahant Marsh, um, or we are going to provide this link in the chat box if you'd like. So here are all 27 species that are found um, here in Iowa and Illinois. I only covered, I think about eight or nine of them. Um, so there's a lot more out there. So you can go through and see all of these different species and some of their key characteristics similar to what we talked about. Um, and so you can study them by looking at the terms and their characteristics, or you can also try things like the flashcards. Um, you can try learn, which I really like. Um, it gives you a picture and you can choose four of, or you can, it's kind of a multiple choice. So it gives you four options and you choose what species you think it is. Um, you can test yourself, you can play games. I think it's a really good resource to learn some of the different species that are out there. And it's kind of fun too. So we'll go back. All right. 
So with that, I'd like to just say thank you guys so much for tuning into this webinar today and learning about some really awesome insects that we have. Um, I know I went through it a little quickly, but I hope you guys were able to learn a whole lot and maybe even find some cool things that you can look up on your own later. So at this time, I'd like to take any questions that we might have. So feel free again to put those in the Q&A box um, and we'll try to answer as many as we can. So we had a few questions early on. Um, somebody had missed the beginning of the presentation and just wanted to review the difference between a dragonfly and damselfly. Absolutely, I'll even uh, go back to that page there just to give a visual. So again here, the dragonflies are going to be much larger. Their wings are going to be open at rest um, and those are really the main things. So much larger bodies and wings open. And then damselflies on the other hand are gonna be much smaller, um, skinnier and kind of more dainty. And their wings will be folded behind them when they're at rest. Another question um, was about when will the nymphs usually emerge from the water at the marsh? That's an awesome question. Um, so. It again depends on the species and just when the, the adults mate and lay their eggs. So I've already seen um, a couple adults that have been out. So I know that some of them have already begun um, emerging, but I would say that primarily they emerge in the, in the early summer, um, kind of around June, July. And we'll actually see um, about that time, we'll see a bunch of the leftover skins, the exuvias, just hanging out on our dock so you know that they're emerging, which is pretty cool. Helps us keep our mosquitoes low. Okay, we've got a, several more questions here. Um, right. What is your favorite dragonfly or damselfly? Ooh, that's a really good question. Um, man, that's a good one. I don't know, I think, I think the Eastern Amber Wing is pretty cool um, just because they're so different and that bright orange is really easy to tell. Um, but I would also say that the Ebony Jewel Wings are cool too, the ones with the matte black wings just because they're so different from the rest. Okay, um, another question is which species do we see most at Nahant Marsh? Hmm. Um, I would say they see a fair amount of both. I've been seeing, I think, more damselflies than dragonflies recently, um, but that may just be because of their different um, times with emerging. But I would say it's probably pretty even. Okay. Um, another question is, what do damselflies eat? Awesome. Yeah, so they eat the same things um, as dragonflies. They eat insects, um, but they just eat smaller ones because their bodies are smaller. So they also have that mouth part, um, but dragonflies are kind of considered the, the bigger predator just because they are so much larger. Okay. Um, what do their eggs look like? So I can go back to that. Um, it, they're really small. And let me tell you, I had a really hard time finding a photo. So apparently they're very secretive too. Um, oh boy, that didn't work. Go back to it. There we go. So this is what they look like. I'd say they almost kind of look like seeds um, in a thick jelly. So they're kind of a brownish color. All right, and um, one more question here, it looks like. Can dragonflies sting you? Can they sting you? No, they don't have stingers. Um, really, their only defense is their mouths, which um, 
like they said, they can bite, but they can't break the skin. So it really, I've been bitten before and it really doesn't feel like much. So. Okay. Um, does the damselfly shed? Yes, they also shed their exoskeletons as they um, grow larger as nymphs. And then again, as they come out for that final stage to become an adult, they do shed. Um, I, a lot of the pictures that I included today were dragonflies just because they're so much larger and uh, therefore easier to photograph. So there's uh, definitely more of an abundance of the dragonfly photos than there are damselflies. Do dragonflies eat damselflies? You know, I was wondering that myself. Um, I would imagine that they probably could because they're going to be a similar size to other insects, but nothing I found um, kind of supported that. So I'm going to say possibly. Why are they called damselflies? Good question. Um, I try to look into the names of these critters actually. Um, I didn't find much really about damselflies, although I did find something to support um, kind of about dragonflies and something to do with some ancient like folklore stories about them um, and how they kind of fly and um, act similar to dragons. So good question and I'm not sure. <laughs> All right, we'll wait just another few minutes here or see if anybody has any other questions. Okay, so someone says that, um, Annie says, we have a pond with fish and have been planting plants to attract dragonflies and damselflies. Will the fish eat the nymphs? Um, yeah, so during that nymph stage, they are very uh, vulnerable to predators, even though they are predators themselves. Um, so I would say that yes, they can. Um, but as you can see in this picture here, the female will lay a lot of eggs. And I believe that's just because it's kind of expected that they will, you know, have a number that die due to predation. So to answer so your question, yes, but I think you'll still get dragonflies and damselflies to come there. And just a follow-up question to that one, how can we protect them? That's an awesome question. So like I said, dragonflies and damselflies, um, they live in areas with water, with slow moving water. So that's places like ponds, um, slow moving streams, lakes, even marshes. So what you can do is help to protect those natural ecosystems, places like Nahant Marsh um, that have the habitat that they need because if they don't have the habitat, they will not survive. So what you can do is just support those kind of places. Okay, and um, what are the predators to the adults? Predators to the adults is going to be um, primarily birds I found. So they are really fast flyers though. So um, I'd imagine it have to be one very fast and very skillful bird, um, but they're not primarily, um, I would say that they escape a lot of them just because they are so fast and a lot of the birds just can't keep up with them because it's going to be smaller birds, um, kind of, you know, the size of robins that would be eating them. The really fast predators like peregrine falcons or eagles and whatnot, um, they're going to be going after much larger prey, so. And then can you um, also go back to, um, can dragonflies eat damselflies? Yes. So um, just to recap, I didn't find anything that said necessarily that they do, um, but I would imagine that they could. Um, they may be a little bit large, just depending on the size of the dragonfly, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna go with the, yes, they probably could. And they probably do on occasion. I believe that mosquitoes are their favorite, um, favorite foods though, so that helps us. Okay, well, it looks like there are no more questions at this time. And um, just to reiterate, there will be resources sent out to you 
um, via email, including a recording of this webinar and some of the links that um, Kelsey mentioned in her presentation. There are also the links can be found uh, in the Q&A and chat. So thank you all for tuning in today. Thank you so much, guys.